today uh, we're going to be talking about some uh, bow fishing and other uh, uh, archery related topics with our special guest today. Hi, my name is Rory Kenterbury and he hosts today here on Arch Talk 101. And before we get started, I just want everybody to know that uh, uh, as well as recording them on the audio, we also have the video goes out to my YouTube channel, as well as those in the Arch Talk 101 Facebook group have a little advantage because they get to listen to it and watch it live and even interact with it. So if you're not a part of that group, I'll go ahead and join. It's Arch Talk 101 Facebook group. And today we have uh, Tom on, on the line with us. Uh, introduce yourself, Tom, and tell us a little something about yourself. So my name is Tom Webster. I live out here in Southeast Wyoming. Uh, I run one of Wyoming's only bow fishing charter businesses out here. Started back in 2020 and becoming pretty, I guess, super involved in everything. I guess bow fishing with stuff across the country as well. So as being, now, uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Now, if they're interested in uh, connecting with any charters, how do they get a hold of you? Uh, right now, so I'm in the middle of getting my website redone. So either my Facebook or uh, Instagram right now is the best time where they can give me a phone call. So, okay. And I'll put a link in the description so make it easier for her to find you. Yeah, that'd be perfect. So, how would how did you get started in archery? Uh, it was more of a like a rehabilitation thing. I got hurt kind of, and about you know, twelve years ago, and I picked up just archery with a friend of mine, and we started you know elk hunting with start with a recurve, and then I got tired of missing shots. You know, with, my bow and have an elk come in to thread the needle with a recurve and I still haven't got that elk yet so but I still have fun chasing them with a the bow so so yeah, sorry about the yeah. recurve and then I bought a compound and then when I got a compound those those shots I had with my recurve didn't show up anymore so it's kind of I don't know <laughs> what happened yeah you get the recurve you get the good go shots get the compound and they disappear on you Pretty much where they come in where they're like, okay, here they're going to come in. And then they, yeah, I don't know. Or I just whiffed them, you know, and just, it happens. But it's still fun. I still enjoy, I think I chase, go after elk more than anything, just because with work, I always took my uh, time off in September. So that would be the thing I chase mostly. And then yeah. bow fishing became a small little thing of where I lived is like, going for walks with my dogs and down by the river and then evolved from my <laughs> from that to shooting fish out of a walleye boat to going on an actual boat fishing trip with old Brian Quaka down in uh, Louisiana to eventually in 2020 getting the boat and starting a guide business so it went from one little hobby to trying to make it even more so it kind of got addicting <laughs> Yeah, it can do that when you get it, something like that, you know, where you have uh, uh, something that you enjoy doing. Next thing you know, it turns into a job. And and as long as you're still having fun, then it's not really a job, right? Yep. So it's it, it's been a fun, fun thing. I mean, we put a couple of records in the boat. I mean, we we chase basically what the carp angler, I mean, like the mirror carp. I know the European carp anglers really hate me. I mean, I get a lot of pretty much violent threats from them from Europe all the time when I take the big <laughs> mirror kind of funny so yeah well you, one area it's a it's a prized possession and the other one it's a prized catch so <laughs> yeah I mean even in the bow fishing community a mirror carp's a prized catch in a lot of places because they're not very uh I guess prevalent but out here in wyoming we have three lakes and that's all you shoot so we get pretty like oh just another mirror carp you know what i mean so now, it's kind now of, for our listeners and watchers what's the difference between the different types of carps so out here we only can take non-game fish species so we pretty much just target the mirror carp and the common carp the common carp were the ones you see with all the full scales and the mirror carp have like patchy scales and there's they classify some as a leather carp that virtually have no scales. So, but like when you're shooting them in the water, like if the sun hits the mirrors just right, they reflect like gold. And so it kind of, you get a mirror finish from them in the water. So that's, I think, why they call them mirror carp. So. 
a little bit different. Yeah. And in my opinion, sometimes they can be really easy or really tough to shoot. And um, it just, I guess it just depends on the weather or this sort of time of year. Cause some days you go out there and you'll just smack the hell out of them and they're easy to get on the next day. It's like 30 yards away. They're busting you. Like, like come on. <laughs> yeah. Like all, all uh, uh, game animals and non-game animals. Uh, sometimes they know they've been hunted and other times they don't. Yeah, like we just got off our state tournament yesterday, and it was a rough one. The fish were super spooky. Like you get on, you'd see groups of 50, 30 of them, and they would just be gone, like way far ahead of you. Normally, you can just get on them really close with a trolling motor. And this time, it was like, I mean, we only shot like 40 fish, but we didn't get we didn't get the right fish. So, yeah, and and I pulled up for those that are watching. Um, I'm going to try sharing my screen, and uh, uh, that is what you're talking about, right? Yep, that's a mirror carp. Yeah, mirror carp. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. It looks like it's got real big scales and a big patch in, in the middle that has no scales. And yeah, and from what I've read, that the mirror carp were bred for more of a commercial purpose because they were easier to clean. It's like they're technically just kind of like a subspecies of the common. Oh, they're yeah. just there's like a, a genetic difference where the scales were just seldom and they found they were easier to clean than the full scale ones. So they started breeding them as just, you know, just doing a, a genealogy thing to for over there and, you know, Europe and that area. So. Something, something just a little bit, a little bit different. Yeah. Well, I think they were easier to clean commercially when they're flaying them because there's not as many scales to get through, I think is what it was. Oh yeah. Well, and then for those that are um, looking here, let's let's see. Come on, start up. Now that that's the common carp you're talking about right here. Yep, that's the one that everybody. See. That's the original United States invasive fish species. So. Yeah, and for those that, that don't see it, there's a lot of lot of smaller scales on it, and. And if it's a caught carp, you know, whether it be in doe ball or, or with a bow, um, that's what most of us shoot. But up there where you're at, the mirror carp is what you uh, what you have most of. Yeah, well, it's weird. We got a little bit of both. We have some lakes that are just strictly commons. It goes from like three lakes where it's nothing but mirrors. We start getting a little combo, and then it goes from uh, then it goes right to commons. And so oh. it's kind of a it's a weird deal. It's all in the same river system too. So, yeah, it's, that's kind of uh, interesting how they uh, um, kind of group and then they mix and they group back up again. And yeah, so I'm trying to figure out which one it is and uh, like how they. I swan, I'm kind of curious about why it goes from just mirrors and when the commons come in. Like, there's one lake up there by Casper where there's kind of a mix, and after that, it just goes straight to the commons all the way out to Nebraska. So, but they're all in the North Platte River system. So, yeah, and that's where I'm. I'm here in Nebraska, on the eastern part of Nebraska, and you know that's all I've seen is the common carps. I haven't seen the other ones, so that would be yeah, interesting I mean, to have see one of those. Yeah, like you get out in most places, you'll shoot you know 50, 60 commons to one mirror, and we have a lake that you'll shoot 30, 40 mirrors to one common. So, <laughs> just it's yeah. kind of funny. Now, how so, are, how are they different in taste? They taste much I don't different? know. I've never eaten a carp yet. Like I haven't. Oh, got, I, I haven't quite got to. That. I have some recipes from some guys from like Michigan and Minnesota for smoking and stuff. I just haven't. By the time I get them back to the house, they're pretty nasty. So, oh yeah, yeah, they, they they're good to put in the garden. Yeah, I got a my carp pile is about. 136 yards from the house strategically placed so oh, yeah. <laughs> the no, coyotes I, try, the coyotes try to get on them and so yeah that's kind of funny plus i've had a pretty good population of golden eagles lately kind of hitting it so it's been kind of cool with them oh yeah and the coyotes it gives you a good a good uh attractive to uh um take some coyotes yeah and then you know i get the buzzards but it's weird that 
the buzzards will not touch a carp until they're seven days old, until like until like a week old, until they start eating them. Huh, that's that's weird. <laughs> yeah, I, I noticed that. Like, I'll put a bunch. I'll put a bunch of fresh ones out there, and I won't see them touching it for a week. I don't know if it's they wait for them to get decomposed to get into them easier. I I don't know. It's just weird. <laughs> yeah, that, maybe sometime we'll have to have a uh, a biologist come on and talk about that. <laughs> yeah, I it's. It's kind of one of them things that's just, I noticed that the last couple of years when I put it out there, you'll see them and then I'll put a fresh pile out there and it'll be three or four days, five days till I see them actually eating them. So. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, there's always, always something we learn, you know. Yeah. I know I've, I've had cart before and I smoked it and I forget what kind of wood I used to smoke. It wasn't hickory. It was one of the, the fruit ones, you know, like a, a plum or apple or something like that and i when i had it i was just like man this almost tastes like ham it yeah really like that's what smoked. i was told that's what my friend i've been told it's kind of like a smoked ham you got to cook it a little bit hotter but <laughs> excuse me uh, they i've been told that don't get the really big ones like the 20 pounders you want like the five to ten pounders the smaller ones and get them in springtime more when the water's colder so and they yeah. apparently they fish better and they say same thing with those suckers we got a bunch of those white suckers around here and i just haven't tried that man everybody eats them in over like michigan in that area but i haven't tried them here yet yeah they're it's it's good you just got to know how to fix them and you know everybody says you know the bone structure and the carp is so 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 bad and it's like but when you look at some of the other bone structures some of the other fish uh, you know, like walleye, they have kind of similar bone structure. You got all these bones. Yeah, northern um, pike, you know. And yeah, yeah. So but it's yeah, just you know, a matter of knowing how to deal with them, right? I, yeah, I guess. And then, you know, like I always tell people, it's kind of funny. They talk about, like, if I eat them or not. I was like, no, I haven't done it. But, you know, carp are one of the most sought-after game fish worldwide and some of the most eaten worldwide. But here in the U.S., I guess we have other better eaten fish. I think that's why when they were – illegally introduced into wyoming and into the u.s it was supposed to be for uh you know food populate you know for the europeans and the immigrants that came over and then i guess that we, there's better fish to eat than the carp yeah well we have a, a a local fish place that sells carp and catfish is all they sell you know that's, that's yeah i've heard about serve. that place i've heard about <laughs> that place there, there's, there. there's a couple places that that do that in uh, here in omaha area that that catfish and uh, carp is their their main main thing they eat and, yeah, they and do the... are they serving the silvers or the big heads or are they doing the commons you know you can't tell because what they do is they score it so when they fry the crap out of it it, it burns up all the bones so okay I, I have i have no idea <laughs> what kind of carp it I, is because i know that like talking to some guys over there because i've been over to and done a couple tournaments on like out of Blair on the Missouri River there, and I haven't. And they, I've been told for people to eat the big head carp, and the, they got really, it's really severe white meat, not like the because they're more of a filter feeder, so it's a different flavor profile than the yeah. carp than the almonds that eat on the bottom that are kind of more of a fatty red red meat. So, and I know that's kind of been a big subject over there in the missouri river and stuff and I'm, i guess we're lucky we don't have them up the platte river yet because it i guess that river is considered a dead river over near side of the state so they don't migrate up past a certain point i don't think so yeah yeah that's it you know they've got a lot of lakes and then there's the grass carp they keep in a lot of them to kind of keep the grasses down uh, yeah and but it I, doesn't work too I, well <laughs> Yeah, I think that's where, you know, I get a lot of, like, on my, I have a TikTok channel that first, it got deleted, like, a year ago, and I revamped it, and the biggest thing I get is, they're talking, talking about how the carp help with the weeds, and stuff. no, that's the grass carp that are used as a, helping for the weeds and everything as a, but they're, you know, they're triploids, and they don't, uh, they don't breed, supposedly, but with the commons and everything, they're just, they just wreak havoc, and certain areas i get they poison the wetlands and poison the lakes i mean nebraska's had three big areas they poisoned off in the last couple of years to get rid of them so yeah i know up there, ones, they'll take a lake and do that they'll, they'll kill well, them they all did, off and 
Yeah, they just did one recently in central Nebraska, I saw. And then I remember a couple of years ago, they, they killed off the entire Ogallala, Ogallala wetlands to get rid of them. So and I remember seeing the thing said, calling all bow fishermen, come and shoot whatever fish you want to. We're going to poison it at this date. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, there was some massive northern pike in that lake, massive largemouth and everything. And they just, to get rid of them all, to get rid of the carp, they just said, you know, we'll just, we got to take a risk and get rid of them. So, yeah, sometimes you have to do that. You have to just, you know, and they get too invasive, just kill them all off. Now, the Asian carp, that's a little different story because, you know, a lot of those in the rivers and, and they, they're jumping in the boats and everything else. Yeah. And... I mean, that's fun. I've done it once or twice. Like, if you haven't, if you're not used to, I mean, that's a kind of funny experience, but then you get some areas where you see how thick they are and how prevalent. And I think, you know, we get a, we talk about invasive species and there's people trying to classify the common carp now as are they're naturalized in the U S so they're not invasive anymore. I was like, yeah. they're the original invasive species and a lot of places it still is. And it's like, I think they took over every state in the, in the lower 48 in less than 50 years. So. Yeah. And I think that's what they're trying to stop with those Asian carp trying to get into places. I mean, they're all the way up, I guess, think what stopped them going up into Montana and stuff for just those dams there at like uh, Gavin's Point and certain spots. They just can't get past certain areas. So I think, but I think if they get into those big lakes and stuff, man, it's no stopping them. Yeah. And kind of dangerous when you're going down the boat and all of a sudden fish start jumping in the boat after you. <laughs> yeah. I like we, we've had a couple about, take you out the knees as when you have a 20 30 pound silver torpedo coming out of the water at you that's kind of <laughs> yeah and you have dozens of them but i mean i mean that's fun but you know it's it is it is a bad thing that we have going on and, and it was just i know they were brought over as kind of a used as a tool in the fish farms out in like lower mississippi and everything for catfish farms to filter out and keep the ponds clean and then when we had those big floods that's where they escaped from so yeah well and, and when you mess with the ecosystem take something from one country move it to another one the natural predators aren't there and cause problems yeah. and that's the thing with you know the common carp once they get a certain size there's no really natural predators for them especially up here you know you get some places like you know down in texas you know the big alligator gar and there's big fish that can get them i they try to use uh, tiger musky in some of these places as a last resort to get them when they're small, but it's, you know, when they outcompete spawning with, you know, I think a female spawn, you know, a couple hundred thousand eggs, it's kind of, you really can't, you know, other species that outcom they just outcompete everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's, been, it's been a, it's been a fun whirlwind. Like I'm trying to build another boat here this winter and I just got, voted less yesterday two days ago as the president of our boat fishing association here in wyoming and oh, also cool. the, and i'm also the state rep for the boat fishing association of america so i get pretty pretty big into it right now we're kind of fighting a battle with our state parks for it seems like bow fishermen are getting targeted for uh, legal fishing and so it's they're get, trying to make us have a 400 yard buffer between like any man-made structure which eliminates half of our lakes pretty much uh virtually eliminates all the sport all the spear fishermen i mean there's not very many of them or if you want to go wading and bow fish for carp you can't do it because it's violating their but under the game and fish under the fishing regulations bow fishing is considered fishing equipment for non-game fish species so that's we're going through a little tussle right now that's making it really difficult for us here in the state yeah it seems like we get something that's fun to do and and perfectly uh um legal to do they want to make it illegal now <laughs> yeah they're and they were trying to classify a bow fishing bow and archery stuff as a firearm is what right what states under the regulations <laughs> as a firearm so, <laughs> yep yep and it's <laughs> state something like any a firearm and then it says like archery or whatever you know will be considered a firearm too and it's a 400 yard barrier between any man-made structure and so that's they're talking about roads and fence i mean it's just pretty much 
a dam is a man-made structure. So like you can't pretty much eliminate so many areas for it's kind of they I think it's just they're not very educated on like only realize how far 400 yards actually is. Sometimes 400 yards is across the entire lake. So right, and, and you're not shooting a bow that far. <laughs> yeah, especially a bow fishing bow. Like it's like we're shooting. <laughs> And I'm hoping that we can get in and talk with the game and fish. I think what we're going to have to do is to kind of get that loophole because the, underneath their stuff, it says uh, it's the game and part, the, the game and the park service is different than the game and fish It's two different entities, but they say the, the parks guys can't regulate boating and fishing, but now they're trying to make it, they're trying to make their own little loopholes for boat, like for just so, if we get game and fish to regulate the species we shoot, so we're trying to get some game fish added, and that way they can't even say anything about us. So, oh. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it's gonna get into I think where we got to go and sit down and be like, you know, where is your proof of? Because we had some guys get some tickets recently, and there was no people calling in for disturbances or anything. Most time the public is really interested in what we're doing and kids especially come out they're like hi what are you doing or they're we're doing the evening time and you know because we don't go we try not to go around campgrounds but sometimes you're you for you come around a corner and there's a camp or somebody fishing and so it's not like it's we're intentionally trying to be around other people but you know the kids come up to the bank and try to talk to you and they call us the alien boats because the lights and you know oh. and, <laughs> But for the most part, the public here and other other fishermen are like, especially the walleye guys and some of the trout guys. I mean, that's there's a fine line between some of the fly fishermen like to target them. But for the most part, it's they want to get them thinned out because they do go in when they're in spawning seasons, like when walleye spawn and trout spawn stuff, they go in there and they start eating the eggs. And so and they go in there and just wreak havoc on stuff. Yeah, so so now then the, the species they want to get and want to eat are gone because yeah. the carp are eating up everything so yeah you know the, as the carp popularly goes up everything goes down because they're not spawning and yeah and there's some of lakes i mean you go into and we'll i mean there is a lake by my house i went in last year right when they filled it up and i saw i found a school of carp that was 250 yards long oh geez <laughs> like as far as you can see they were i mean there was thousands of them that at our state tournament yesterday like we came on the wind came down and early morning i'm in my bet we saw five six thousand fish on the surface in one in, in, in one headwater so oh, I, they're just that's a they're lot just, of fish <laughs> yeah and that's just one part of the lake and they're everywhere like you know they have we have these big reservoirs and when you go into some of these bays and you'll see a school of three four hundred fish come out like it's and then you come back and here they come back in again or it's a whole nother group and we have i mean thousands and thousands of fish and i tell people like the bow fishing that we take doesn't even dent the population of what's in the lakes no and we we can shoot we can shoot you know a thousand fish a day and not even dent the population in one lake so yeah. <laughs> i don't count the other lakes that are infested with them either yeah so i mean it's and plus out here, you know, Wyoming is so empty, as I want to say. Uh, some of our lakes, I mean, we'll, we'll go out there and we'll, I'll be the only one bow fishing sometimes. I mean, there's a few of us that do it. I mean, there's some recreational guys, but as for guys that really do it, there's only like, like I think our tournament yesterday had 10 boats. So, like, it's, oh. so you, go like, you go like Michigan and those places, a tournament has 250 teams in a, in a tournament, and we're out here with 10. <laughs> yeah, it, so, you're only going to get so many fish. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm glad we, I, I'm kind of glad we don't have that many teams right now because we don't have the area to dispose of fish right now. <laughs> like, I took oh, all the yeah. fish home yesterday. I have all the fish in my pickup right now, just getting ready to go go dump them but i forget i was like oh i gotta do this first so, <laughs> so i got about you know three thousand pounds of carp in my pickup right now <laughs> that, that's a load of load of fish yeah i mean they're all like you know 10 12 pounds but they're not like the giants we shot last year they were all in the 15 to 20 pound range so it just is what it is but yeah so i have a whole but we had some issues you know i've been on a 
mission of not dumping carp so we get a bad name and with our stuff going on with our game with the state parks and stuff now i don't want to give them any more ammo when we have floating dead fish on the beaches and oh not yeah to, so i was like i'll just if we have less than 10 teams i'll just throw them all in my pickup and bring them with me so just to kind of mitigate that i don't want to give any more gas for the fire for those to come no. against us and as you get bigger then you you know find some place that you can take it that will process yeah. them and, you know make good yeah. fertilizer or something out of them and, well I haven't, I've been having an idea on that, trying to make, because like, you know, we just dump fish and I'd rather find ways to utilize them properly for where they're right. not going to waste. Like I've been, I guess it gets down to funding and, you know, money that I, I personally don't have, but I would like to figure a way to turn them into a fish meal and then grind them in and turn them into, extrude them into fish pellets and sell them back or get or to fish hatcheries and other things because they are full of omega-3s and proteins and that type of stuff and then we don't have right. to uh decimate like most of fish food comes from sardines from the ocean and the bait fish out there and then we can with so much carp and all that stuff in our states right now we could figure a way to utilize a you know a non-game fish for something more uh productive so without having to target you know ocean you know you know deplete the oceans anymore because i mean as a commercial fisherman i've seen it but it's one of them deals i'd like to turn an invasive trash fish that we have no shortage on into something more uh useful in, in the country so yeah and who knows maybe somebody listening or, or watching uh you know has some connections into something like that and you know maybe we can work something out and and, yeah. and you know put them to a good use like that re, re put them back into the uh, the ecosystem and i know when i i go out fishing i always take and i always bury the the fish guts and bones and stuff in the garden and it's it, it's always really good for the garden yeah and i'm hoping to start doing that here with some of my carp and turning it into a, a big compost pile with until it with like you know my neighbor's got a few corrals with horse manure and cow manure and stuff in it that he's stashing a pile on the side and yeah turn that into a uh, soil for you know people can come get loads of it for their gardens and their and stuff like that which would be really really good for them so yeah that'd make a, a good additive to put in your your garden yeah so i mean there's i mean there's ideas out there it's just getting the time and stuff to do it like everything else when you have so much you know i work a full-time job in the oil field on top of all of this so it's oh. <laughs> I'm pretty busy on some days. Like I don't even forget to do my own housework by the time I'm done with stuff. So, yeah, full full time job, and then doing uh, everything else. Another yeah. full time <laughs> full time job, you know. Yeah, but our season's only a few months long, so by the time I'm done with bow fishing, it gets into uh, <laughs> hunting season. Which yeah, this year we're you know I, I drew quite a bit of tags this year, but we had a, you know, a massive winter kill out here this year. And there's a lot of guys that don't think you should hunt. And it's been, I've been kind of on some of these hunting pages and it's getting brutal of people trying to pressure you into not harvesting the animals that you've drawn. You know what I mean? And so, I mean, it gets into like, do you want to, I mean, there's some areas that weren't hit as hard and we've been battling, you know, CWD and EHD in some places. And, but, you go to the western side of the state, you know, absolutely got hammered with the animal, the animal die off for deer and especially and deer and antelope, especially. So it's, it's kind of sad seeing driving to Craig, Colorado for work and you'd see three, 400 dead deer in, in the, in the whole, uh, trying to be on the roads, get out of the snow and, you know, those truckers just plow through them. They don't care. So there's yeah. legs sticking out of all the snow banks mm -hmm. and it's, you know, I did see I did see it firsthand down in the southwest side of the state, this eastern side of where I live. I don't think I don't think it was hammered as hard as what they say. So because I see I've been seeing a lot of a lot of deer. When I I'd probably drive a thousand miles a week sometimes for work, and I've been seeing a lot of younger deer, like a lot of younger bucks especially. But we get a lot of moisture, so they, their health is pretty good right now. So they're they're coming up pretty quick but this gets into do you want to heart i've been 
I was uh, talking to some guys the other day and I said, it's not about going out and shooting the spikes and the forks because they're easy. You need to be more selective in your harvests and target the mature mature bucks and the dry does you know that don't have fawns and stuff like that i mean just right. you actually gotta hunt and just don't take because they're easy so and that's i think what it gets down to with types of years like this i mean i think if it was that bad in areas i don't need the game and fish the biologists would issue tags if it was you know what i mean like they're issuing enough to sustain hunting but keep the populations around so yeah and I don't know about it there, but I imagine, you know, like they do it here as well, is they're going to look and say, okay, how many deer do they have in an area? What are they expecting to have? And then how many tags do we need um, to issue? Because this area is going to hold X amount of, of deer. And, yeah. you know, if you have excess, issue more tags. If you don't have excess, you issue less. Um, yeah, and, then, and that's how I'm thinking. I've been, I'm a big advocate, though, especially for a mule deer around here, that we need a point system on on the antler growth because i have seen the last couple of years but i i haven't harvested a mule deer buck in two years like i haven't seen one like a mature buck that i want to target and take just for that factor so i mean i'm pretty picky and choosy what i take anyways and so i don't want i don't feel the need people we need to get pressured by other hunters for that reason it's like you know i have a tag i'm gonna go hunting if, but if i find a deer i want to harvest i'm gonna harvest it but i'm not right going out there taking a spike and i mean i, I let a lot of 130 four by you know smaller two three-year-old mule deer walk all the time like sometimes i'll let five six deer walk before i even take one so it's just finding the right one and the and the one you want to shoot so and i have seen non-residents come in and they don't get out of their trucks and they spend three four hundred dollars on a tag and they have a bunch of forked horns in their truck you yeah. know and i've talked to other even 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 residents like we're i hate to say this but i always say hunters and fishermen we're our own worst enemies like because we <laughs> seem to we seem to can't get along and uh be for the same cause for some stuff like you know, see it on some of these forums you see a kid with a big you know 30 pound muskie that they randomly caught on their kid pole or whatever and they're in their keep many of these adult men that are scouting the kid and their parents for keeping that fish you know you should teach catch and release and i was like you know that 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 fish right there could have got that kid a lifetime addiction in the outdoors you know i was like right we should be if it's legal and we have the opportunity to take them, we shouldn't be pressuring each other to do stuff is how I feel. Like we buy the licenses itself and it's, and our, I guess, uh, divisiveness in the hunting and fishing community only gives the people that are anti that gives them more fire with our own ammunition that we give them. So right. like, I think we came together more and be more, uh, what's it called uh, a close knit and support each other we'd have i think a lot more i guess ground to stand on when it comes against the anti-hunters and yeah. the animal activists and everything but right now we have you know a bunch of bad apples and that's what they look at is the bad apples of the group and and quite of course like i will say when I post some stuff and they, I get a smart ass remark. I become a smart ass back. So like, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I can't help it, but I try to uh, do a lot more stuff as an educational, like, Hey, you know, we need to not be pressuring other hunters. You know, some guys could have might be there one time they were come to Wyoming and sorry that they put in before the winter kill hit and it's not their fault, you know? And if they right. want to come out here, it's their right to harvest a tag, but it's, you know, our responsibility to, like I said, do the selective harvest and harvest mature deer and not target the easy ones just because they're easy. So, yeah, I know, you know, if you, if it's out your, your first year, I, I told my kids to go hunting, you know, deer hunting. And um, I was like, okay, this is your first deer. The first one you see, go ahead and shoot it if you want. You know, yeah. if, if it's a fawn, after that, we're going to talk about letting fawns walk. And, yeah, and uh, you what, know, but your first year get one, I and mean, after yeah, that, like okay, got now thing, go. We got a thing that says in our regulations that a youth hunter can take any deer, whether it's antler list or you know, or antler deer. Which that I am, I am 
uh, very okay with because, you know, most, I think our youth is 12, can I sure 12 to 16 is what it is. Right. And so, I mean, that's absolutely, like, that's the way it should be. You go out there, you go hunt with your family, you get your deer. But once you get that age where you can get in there, start, uh, you have to do the selective harvest followed by the, you know, that's how I feel. Like if you're a kid or, I mean, we have some areas where it's handicapped access only, you know, if you can go in there with a wheelchair, I mean, there should be certain stuff that they could get as, you know, as a uh, disabled, you know what I mean? Like, but, uh, right. uh, an able-bodied person's not that hard to go walk out and look for something and put the time in to find not something that's driving on the side of the road and you go 20 yards and pick it up and risk getting a ticket because you can't shoot out of so you're shooting out of your pickup at a little fork and horn that spends more time next to the road than he does anywhere else yeah oh. yeah well and um i know here in nebraska i was at uh, one of the parks and uh in their office was a full-size deer mount with bullet holes in it <laughs> they would funny. set they would set it out um you know back off the road a ways and wait for somebody to just pull up and shoot it someplace where they couldn't be hunting and it would it, the full-size mount would be standing there and they would shoot and then go give them a ticket yeah we <laughs> i grew up in southeast alaska and we had uh the game and fish do that or the state troopers try to do that with uh one of the little mobile deer and what their mistake was is they were using a white tailed deer in a in a Sitka blacktail area. And so oh. I was like, that's <laughs> we're like we were up people got a mess, like, you need to go away from us. We're like, you're an idiot. Like that's the wrong species of deer. Like, of course we, we're not gonna try to shoot that thing, you know. <laughs> yeah. When your dag says one kind of deer and it's a different kind of deer, then <laughs> yeah, we're and we go up there, we're like, we're messing with it, and like you need to go away. This is like, no, you're an idiot, you know, you guys need to bring the right right kind of deer out like these sick of black tails aren't that big <laughs> yeah so <laughs> it was, you know was, uh, so we, we laughed about that one it was like a, you know a 140 inch white tail you know <laughs> like 100 pounds bigger than anything else we see so it was pretty it, it was pretty funny <laughs> yeah sometimes i don't think about it you know it's it's one of those things that hey <laughs> I guess they didn't think that us road hun- our road hunters knew exactly what we were shooting at. Oh, it's a deer. Let's just shoot at it. No, wrong one. <laughs> so. yeah, wrong one. Yeah, I know. It's, you know, when, when you know, talking about different sizes and stuff, I know there's, uh, you know, when bass fishing up here, you can't bow hunt for them, you know, you know, because it's game fish. Oh, uh, actually, know, 20- after, after July 1st, you can shoot any game fish during the daylight in Nebraska. Oh, yeah. I yes. just don't. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I've uh, I almost taken a couple wipers out of Nebra- out of McConaughey, you know, when we're doing, I was out there for a tournament, but those things don't stay on the arrow very well unless you got. No. <laughs> <laughs> They're pretty, oh, when you, well, I guess it depends on the arrow. We, we were using, we were using like some of the specialty arrows. I was using the normal little muzzy ones and there. They got a lot of oomph to them. And if <laughs> they were off the oh, arrow pretty yeah. quick when they hit the end. So. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know yeah. there's there's a couple of lakes you know 21 inch size limit and then uh um then when they lowered the size limit to 15 oh he's just seen all the comments are based like why would you why would you take it at 15 it's like and then actually one of the game parts people got in and explained why they have the size limit you know as, yeah. as you have too much bait fish you need to let the fish get bigger as the bait fish yeah. goes down you need to lower them down so it's it's a big balancing act and once the guy explained it, it's like hey that makes sense <laughs> Yeah, and so like right now, like we're talking about, you know, the getting the game and fish to let us have certain game fish species here. We're, I've been trying to get catfish and drum is what I've been trying to get added. It gives us uh, an extra species. You know, it's most people think a drum in the state is a silver carp, and they throw them on the beach when they catch them, anyways. Oh, so yeah. But I think we only have three lakes anyways that got drum in them and like the fish, the regulations on our rod and reels, 50 drum a person. So like, why can't we oh. shoot them with a bow? So, yeah. And then, and then catfish, everybody here, you know, you don't see that many people target catfish, but we got channel catfish everywhere. There's some lakes I go into on like this time of year, the first part of June, I'll see two, 300 of them in a night. And then, and then late fall, like August and, you know, September, October, when all those shad come shallow, those catfish oh, yeah. are up crazy in the shallows chasing chasing shad. So 
and we're trying to just get you know certain access for certain fish to give us more opportunities is all then and we can take you know give us a, a limit like it's you go to the western side of the state any walleye any northern pike and some other you know the predatory fish it's shoot on site and illegal to release them so or cat or if you catch them on rod reel it's illegal so it's like what's the difference of us having access to them on this side of the state in certain bodies of water so yeah you know if it's a fish that you catch you can't release then um you know why not shoot the bow because even if you did release it's not going to live yeah i mean and i've had accidents you know i'm not intentionally like and i, and I will admit it we I mean i've had i've done it myself i had a couple of clients I maybe mean, we've accidentally taken a cat you know catfish in the dirty water and everything and they're like well what are we gonna do i'm like throw them in the cooler and they're like why i was like i'm not gonna throw a fish back that's gonna be dead that i can eat like i don't want to waste it i mean it right it sucks i mean if game and fish come up you know and they ask why i have them like this is what happened it was just i'm not targeting them the water was murky and and accidents happen like if but i'd rather take the fish home and eat it then throw it away because like you know we have that watch and waste rule like they right. see a bunch of catfish dead with an arrow hole in it you know with my name you know airing the opportunity i'm like hey tom why, why are we seeing game fish with arrow holes in them you know so i that's you know i'm riding a fine line on on that aspect and so that's kind of why i want to bring up with we have a meeting with the game and fish but you know we ha we do have accidents where we shot catfish and stuff like that and technically we're supposed to toss them back and so i mean it's 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 a tough one because over in mcconaughey spear fishing is really big for like walleye and all that stuff but you have a size limit and my friends, the assistant superintendent out there, and he was telling me, like, you know, he talks about, like, yeah, they're supposed to, if you shoot one that's under the size of them, you're supposed to just release it. It's considered a released fish, even with <laughs> a, a spear hole in it. So I was like, that kind of defeats the purpose. Like, if you're a spear fisherman, you know, your limit's two or whatever, and it shouldn't be what size, you should just keep the two that you shoot, you know. And that's kind of how I look at it. It's hard to judge a 14-inch from a 16-inch underwater. Right. So. And, and then and then there's to shoot it and then release it you know or spear it and release it you, you know it's going to die yeah so it and then be the now first. you're you're wasting it yeah yeah so it should be if you only, if you take a fish you only get to shoot four so be selective on the ones or two i think i know if it's two or four i forget but it's like you know be selective and take the ones that and don't just shoot one because it's there and it's like oh i want to get a bigger one now it doesn't make the that doesn't that one doesn't make sense to me so yeah that, that encourages to just throw back dead ones and... yeah and but yeah it's been it's been a fun deal with you know the archery hunting i've been kind of slack in the last couple of years i haven't brought i haven't hunted with a bow in probably three years now i don't think just the time and everything with i need to go but i have a brand new pse sitting in a custom built one sitting in my closet and i haven't even put a sight on it yet so <laughs> but i also battle with a really bad astigmatism and an eye injury in my right eye so it's really hard for me to use like a peep sight and that type of deal too so it's a struggle using a compound and i'm really debating going doing to the tradition the more traditional route again but using like you know night a, a, a lever bow more than because i use it all the time for bow fishing and i'm used to the more of the instinctive stuff and just stick with that route so by getting a little bit more hunter you know not the because the bow fishing bows are set up a little bit different so right oh you're shooting a way heavier arrow and you have a string tied to it and... yeah so i mean it's different between shooting a you know a five six hundred grain arrow to an 800 900 grain arrow yeah so. <laughs> right. or in my case my my hunting arrows in in the the 400 range <laughs> Yeah, and that's what I mean. I have a, you know, I just, like I said, I have a bunch of archery stuff. And I think at one point I kind of went from using the cam bows for clients, you know, the compounds to the, the lever bows just because they're a little bit more forgiving on the, especially they got those new Vader. Have you, have you seen those Vader carbon sabers that are out? You heard of them? Um, no, I don't think I have. There's so many things that it's hard to keep track of them. Yeah, and they're, they're a camless lever bow. Uh, they're, they're made here, well, they're built by a veteran-owned company out in the East Coast, but 
<clears throat> what sold me on them is I watched the guy dry fire it 50 times and didn't mess anything up on it. Oh. <laughs> and I, I, I use that. I use PSE for a long time for all my bow fishing bows. But, you know, you get a client that actually dry fires, you know, you pop a cam, bend a cam, and, and it's been oh, a lot yeah. of time. I'm trying to fix that stuff with a bow press these i don't need a bow press you can dry fire them i mean and they're and they're super right they're like two three pounds so they're i went i went to those for a client aspect and i played around with them with what i get in mean, your bow fishing you get arm fatigue just by holding your bow for 10 12 hours during it oh like, yeah and so i mean you get the you know the oneidas are great bows but you know we have those a couple other companies but I still, I, I still love mine, you know, but it's, there's different aspects of what you use for different bows, like everything else. Right. But, you know, that's nice playing with those little Vaders because they're light. And when I'm uh, up running, if clients say I can shoot or whatever, or if I have some ones I can do, a friend, I've been looking at for tournament where I'm running, the bows are smaller. And so I'm not in the way of stuff when I'm trying to, you know, steer a boat in a tournament. So I've been thinking of, that's why it would be good for them. They're very good for that, all that stuff. So, I mean, I've been pretty, pretty happy with them. I got, I think, four more of them coming in the mail here. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I found so uh, Vader bow fishing bows here. Let me go ahead and uh, yep. uh, share my screen here and, and see. Here's, here's the stuff. They do look like they're really short, really short yeah. Oneida. And they're, well, so they're, they're a camless bow. So there's no cams. They're like the same kind of style. Like there is a difference between the cam, but uh, these act more, they feel more like a recurve when you shoot them compared to, they don't break over like a cam to bow. So that's the only right. difference that some people don't like, but they're all made out of carbon fiber. So they're super light and super durable. So these are, these are the bows that you use when you come out with me that I, I switched to. Yeah, and, and those those just just look like the Oneida, which is kind of a, a been around for a long time. <laughs> yeah, so there's a uh, two other companies that make the camless lever bow. One of them's RPM out of uh, Utah, and then uh, there's a custom ones. They're called uh, the the G net through G strings. But I mean, these bows are you know in the Mid, mid range for prices they're not that expensive and that there's a <clears throat> but those i mean it's just all different ones and i just like the weight of the and the durability of the baiters over the rpms and then the gnats are just yeah. you know they're a custom they're a custom bow and they I mean that's a grand when you're done with shooting when you're oh. building one of those things so <laughs> oh yeah shields has the rpm striker um, yeah so it's like 620 uh yeah. the vader bring up the vader here i think i think they're at like 519 so, i think for the carbon state you know 489 i think yeah and then yeah. 519 for their for, for their new shorty they got one that's for kids and that's like a 38 inch so they're a little bit smaller so yeah you know, 23 to 32 inch draw length that's a good range yeah um 40 inch eight inch brace height that's a nice big brace height so yeah and then they have a they nice have a smaller forgiving. one out now called the shorty that's even smaller well let's, it's let's more see. oh there's the shorty yeah yep Five that's inches. more for uh for you know women or people with shorter arms and kids so i'm getting two of these shorties in the you know, here shortly so i, I want to so i can do a pretty good review on them so i'm kind of looking forward to playing with them i like playing with these this stuff so yeah, that'd be interesting when you're done playing with it, you know, upload your opinion to the group and, and yeah. let us hear what your opinion is. And and that's kind of one of my favorite things to do, like with the bow fishing stuff I talk to. I try to go around the community is pretty tight knit. I have friends all over the country and I try to, you know, support all the little businesses and the other guides that have been really good. When I first started, I've had a, a couple reach out like, oh, man, it's cool that you're doing this here in Wyoming and anything we can help you with. So I met some other outfit you know i'm trying to make it pretty big out here and that's been a a thing that's wyoming is not a place that people think it's come bow fishing it's all let's go fly fishing and elk hunting and then now you know here comes i had a friend laugh he's like all of a sudden 
during COVID, here comes this guy from Wyoming posting all these videos, all these are like, when did Wyoming have boat fishing? You know, <laughs> so. yeah, especially since you started it. <laughs> well, I didn't really start. It's, it's been around a while. I mean, there's so we had our seventh seventh annual uh, boat fishing tournament. I've been to three of them or four of them. So, I mean, it's still relatively kind of new. I mean, like there's a few serious guys. I kind of came in later on with doing the YouTube and stuff like that and the videos and posting the guiding thing. I was another guy that was guiding up and he was been really good too. Like, he's like, Hey man, we've been doing this for a few years. Anything we can do to help, you know, let me know. And so like when I went to a couple lakes that I'm not really, they're kind of a ways away he helped like i was like hey i'm coming here with some people like where would you recommend and he's not one of them guys that's like oh no just go find yourself he actually helps and so that's i ran in that with pretty good stuff unless you're a, in a tournament and everybody's tight lipped and you know what i mean like oh i'm not <laughs> seeing anything but for the most part a lot of a lot of the boat fishing community has a lot of good intentions with other people but you know like with anything there's the jack wagons that make shit or they don't yeah. uh <laughs> Or I see guys that act like you don't, they're teaching and they're giving false information, you know, trying to use oh. the wrong bows, the wrong type of equipment that, you know, in my opinion, seeing this, how stuff set up is I, one day I called, I didn't mention with the guy, I'm like, you're going to hurt somebody telling him this stuff. Like you're, you don't use your 70 pound hunting bow to bow fish. Like they're not, the, our arrows aren't designed for that stuff. And I, you've been lucky that you haven't shattered one when you shot one because the, right. the pressure from the cams and you know that new carbon arrows like how they flex when you shoot the fiberglass don't flex like that to take the pressure no. the high torque of those hunting cams and like bow fishing bows even the compound ones are designed to they do have a break but they're also designed to what we call snap shooting you don't got to pull back all the way and you can't do right. that with 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 a hunt with a, a conventional hunting compound bow so it's when I, when I see that type of information coming out there, I'm like, you, you need to stop giving this information because it's going to lead to somebody not knowing really what they're doing and going to hurt themselves. And I don't want to see that happen to anybody. Right. It's, and and the, the regular fishing arrows, so the fiberglass ones, those designed out of the you know, heavier pound bows are actually cladded with the aluminum arrow. So yeah. aluminum arrow with fibers inside so it can take that pressure. But, yeah and yeah. you know most of the fiberglass i mean and they have these new ones that are they uh, they have a carbon fiberglass mix and i've seen it i learned this too last was it last year i went down and shot alligator gar with one uh with that with scotty michelle like with uh south texas bow fishing we you know you see these cool arrows that are a carbon fight they're a carbon fiber and a you know, fiberglass mix but you get in those bigger alligator gar and stuff and you show them like you shoot one and they they torque and that just right in the arrow splinters and the same oh, thing yeah. you know like well it can do it with a compound bow with the right just the right torque or the right and just they just splinter like uh and imagine i can imagine doing that and having a shard go through your hand while you're shooting you know oh and, yeah or something just exploding and like it's I'd rather if you're gonna get into bow fishing, just spend the money and get and get the proper equipment. I mean, in the long run, you're gonna get addicted to it anyway. So, don't convert <laughs> your hunting bow to a fishing bow. I mean, the only ones that you recommend, I would say, unless you're shooting your you know, your traditional recurve, that you know the wooden arrows are kind of similar. Like that'd be the only one I'd say if you're converting your hunting bow, it'd be your your recurve and your traditional bows, not your high end compounds that have the or shooting, you know, 390, 350 feet per second when a bow fishing boat shoots 200 at the oh, like, our yeah. highest ones, you know? Yeah, my, my hunting bows would never be used for fishing. Uh, but yeah. one, I, I I draw back my hunting bow and I expect anchor point feels like, I can't shoot them fast. Yeah, you don't have and, time to draw uh, one of those back. I, like I, I, I have my recurve set up that way so I can just draw back and go. It's yeah, and quicker. I see that a lot when I bring clients. I mean, they're good at archery hunting, but, you know, they pick up the bow fishing bow and they try to go into their fundamentals and their back wall and their stops and all that. I tell them, I'm like, throw all that out the window. Yeah, like, you ain't got time. <laughs> yeah, I was like, it's not even that, too. It's a whole different style of shooting. You're trying to do instinctive. 
And so like by the time you try to get that, you get your rest and your normal stuff and you're, and you're shooting fingers, you're not shooting releases because releases to me in bow fishing are pointless. Like you, right. And so it's pretty fun. I tell them like, whatever you know about bow hunting and using your compound bow to come out, like throw that out the window because you're not even aiming at the fish when you're shooting at them. You're, I always tell clients aim to miss and shoot where the fish aren't. So right. you got to play with that refraction. I was like, just because the fish is here, you got to go underneath. And I always say, aim, I always tell them aim, aim to miss. So yeah, yeah. I, I actually did a, a little little video one time. Uh, somebody asked a question about you know shooting a, at a long distance bow fishing, and I said, well, you gotta well aim I'm, over them. <laughs> you got to aim yeah. over them on that it, point. So. Yeah, you, you know, you're you got your angle and everything. So I just took a glass of water and stuck a, a, a rod in it. And you can see it just jumped over. This is this is why you can't shoot where they're at because they're not there. <laughs> they're elsewhere. Yeah, and then when you're shooting fish on the surface, like when you see we see the potting fish, you see their backs out. You gotta aim on the opposite side of them because how far that arrow drops, you aim on the opposite side of the fish because then the arrow will fall in and hit them that way. So yeah. it's I mean it, it's 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 fun. What I'm I need to get a do for clients is I want to get a a nice laser pointer so i can aim like in front of the fish aim there and you're gonna hit the fish aim aim aim, aim, at, aim at the dot you know what i mean yeah and so because sometimes they have a hard time seeing fish and they're like where are you seeing I'm like you know it's right there like shoot so i want to if i get the laser pointer here aim at that aim at the dot bam because uh, it automatically will do the refraction i can see where the light hits the fish aim aim, aim, aim at my laser pointer dot and then you'll hit the fish <laughs> so yeah it's the, same, the same concept so well, and and the the guys that try to use your hunting setup for bow fishing, um, you know, it's like, well, you can't shoot it the same. Would you shoot your shotgun the same way you shoot your bow? No. Yeah. Would you shoot your rifle the same way? Would you shoot your handgun? No. And then you, you don't shoot them the same. They're different. And I I can't imagine the arm fatigue. Like I shoot, like you know, around forty pounds. Like I think is the most recommend. I mean, most of us shoot for our high end. You know, bigger, deeper fish will shoot you know, 40 to 45 at the most, but most bow fishing bows are in the twenties and thirties because when I mean, you shoot several hundred times a night, the you know, arm, like I, could, I couldn't draw my compound bow back that much. I'm tired after 30 shots, you know, when yeah. I practice in. So there, and there's that too, like the, the more arm fatigue you get, the more, I guess you have risk of hurting yourself and failure and same thing with you know when the bow fishing like more you get tired right. the more risk, the more risk of accidents that's gonna happen towards the end of the night like you can miss and whatever dry fire and then you can mess up you know also if you dry if you slip whatever and they're fixing a cam on a, you, you know those bows will blow up not like the bow fishing bows where the cam just you know rolls over because they're not the torque isn't there so you're gonna right. be risking blowing the cams up or blowing your bow up and you're out two thousand dollars on one of these matthews so oh yeah and and matthews do not take dry fires mm -mm. i don't think yeah. I'm not, i don't have i haven't had any even though even the bow fishing bows don't take dry fires i mean the compounds not like you know they they blow up i mean or they snap a cam or whatever that's that's why i went to that Bader is watching that guy shoot 40 times and nothing and the kit no and not, not even the power limbs were bent like everything was still in alignment is what amazed me yeah that, so. that's good we do it because you know we all know if you're out there you're drawing up the arrow slips off the the, the knock slips off the string and and yeah. you dry fire um you know the compound is that that stomach turning sound when you dry fire a compound and Oh man, or your wrist, or yeah, you know, you know what I mean. Like I, I've never dry fired. I'm a knock on wood, you know, one of my hunting bows. I hope I never do because it's yeah, it's a bad day. And then you know we get into all the reels and everything else. You know, bow fishing is just as addicting as normal archery. You spend lots of money on, and that it's like everything else. Which bow is the best? Which arrow is the best? What reel you're gonna use? And like it's 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 pretty funny. And then the boats. I mean, I always tell them, oh, I just started bow fishing. We're like, good luck. You'll be in and spending 50 grand the next couple of years. So. <laughs> yeah. You get a boat with a high platform on it and, and everything yeah. else. And it's got to be a nice stable one. You can't have just a little bitty canoe. <laughs> and 
you know, I, I, I see that too. Like I see guys bow fish and you see, they see these little, in my opinion, like, unless you're doing it by yourself, but a 20 foot boat is really ideal is what you need. You know, like you need the platform. I see guys out bow fishing and little 1648s and they got five people on that little tiny boat. I'm like, Oh man, <laughs> like I went, I tried doing, uh, when I first started, you know, I, I tried bringing like six, seven people out and it just wasn't, it was just a pain. So I only limit to four people right now until I build my bigger boat, which I've had to sacrifice some trips cause I can't take six people, seven people. Right. But I'd rather be safe than make the money. Right. So yeah, that's... this, so yeah, this winter I'm hoping to build a massive barge is my plan i got some i drew up a plan myself and just gotta get through the summer and sell this one and hopefully have a pretty sweet boat next year so that's that how that, that's how it a little bit of time right <laughs> yeah i've had I've, I've had this boat for three years i mean it's a it's a great boat it's a sea arc with a custom platform but it just what i want to take my business to like i also want to start guiding walleye trips with it too so i need a more of a all-around boat than the uh just the bow fishing so and i love catching walleye and other fish with it so my boat's pretty just i mean i can fish off of it but it's not comfortable you know what i mean so yeah it's meant to stack a bunch of bloody carp and like we shot so <laughs> much with it we, sh- we had so much fish in the boat two years ago on the way home. I snapped the tongue on my boat trailer. I had to get that welded and towed to my house. Oh, and, <laughs> oh yeah. that, that's a but, lot of weight. <laughs> yeah, we had like 120 fish, I think, in the boat. And they were a 23-pound average. So, I mean, you do the math. Like, I should have <laughs> threw, threw them in the pickup instead of in the boat trailer. And I overloaded it. It was my bad. I overloaded it and, you know, had to... <laughs> <laughs> you know, re- re- have my friend come and weld the tongue back on it, but it was pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a lot of fish to put in a boat. <laughs> yeah, and we we had we had a, we had the world record bow fishing mirror carp that day too. But my the kid's dad thought my scale was off because it looked bigger, so we lost. You know, so we didn't get we didn't quite get that world record. But by the time we got to the certified scale, which I mean, it still it was a massive fish at forty three pounds. So, yeah. That's a big carp. <laughs> yeah. And they don't get as big as a grass carp. I mean, there's some areas in Nebraska, people see grass carp that are in the 60, 70 pound range. Yeah. So I'm not, I've only shot a five pounder. I think is my biggest one for a grass <laughs> carp. So, but I mean, I've shot some big heads in those silvers and it's like I said, it's went from a, a rehabilitation thing to kind of an addiction, like a really severe addiction. So yeah, you, you never know when you're going out what you're going to hit. And I had, that one time I was out and I'm shooting it. I think it was Big Heads in there or, or Carp. I forget which one it was now, but I'm shooting it and I'm missing. And then a gar comes by, a little bitty one inch diameter gar. I hit it. Yeah. And, and it's funny, and I like, do that too. Like I can go I, all day and just, I, there's days I go where it's, I can't hit the broadside of a barn. I'm like, what the hell? And then I go out there and it's like, bam, 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 bam. Luckily this year I've been on a lot better than, but I mean, you get some guys, it's like, they don't miss. You get some of those number guys that, you know, go to these tournaments and they shoot eight, 900 fish in like seven hours. It's yeah. like, <laughs> I would like to go see that. Cause I haven't seen that in person. I always go chase the big 20 because I don't know, I like chasing big fish and plus I can't compete with those guys that are into the into that stuff. So like and most of those guys are the or the airboat dudes that get into those places where the fish can't get out and they just oh yeah. So yeah, but I guess I like can that. go in spots that regular boats can't get into. <laughs> and I've been tempted to get an airboat for Wyoming and it's one of those the things that stops me is not the not getting anybody's it's the wind here we get like that's our biggest problem here in wyoming is battling the wind and getting out on the water and those airboats are like a sail on certain points and oh yeah and there's certain times in an airboat here in the early spring and late fall when the platte river is really down man you can get in there and those carp find pools and you get in there and i mean they're in there by the by the thousands you just 
but getting in there and finding them and running, I don't know what the regulations are for running an airboat on the Platte River around Casper and up and down through that area. And the fly fishermen would probably not like me too much because how noisy no. it is. <laughs> so, yeah, it is noisy. Yeah, and I, I mean, I love airboats. They're fun. And like I said, for the most part, we're pretty, our boat fishing here is pretty supported by most people. I've only had one instant where some guy was angry and it was a, I hate to say it, it was a fly fisherman. So he got <laughs> all we were at a state tournament a couple years ago and we went into a bay and we thought this guy was just waiting, shooting fish with a bow. So we're like, okay, we got in there and realized he was fly fishing. And so we, we backed out like 150 yards from him and was out in the middle kind of shooting fish and then doing our thing. And we were calling fish at the boat ramp, you know, and the guy took his boat next to us. And the next thing I know, I get a, on Monday, I get this hate email on my Facebook page and this guy griping to me about how dare a bow fisherman come in a carp flat when there's a fly fisherman in there and got into a little uh, spout about I was like you know dude it's public waters we gave you 150 yards which I feel is pretty adequate you know and like I like the thing is is like what I was like what made me mad like I guess upset is like you could have came and talked to us in person instead of doing this on my on my page you know like and I told him, like, in the end of the day, you know, it was, it's public waters. We all were out here doing the same thing. And you're griping to me about a fish that nobody cares about. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, you could have very easily just went on past him and really and, disturbed well, no, it was just like <laughs> So there was that lake where the, where the carp were at. There was three other boats. And we gave us, we give each other, like, a distance. Like, so we were in one spot. The other guy was another spot. The other guy was another spot. You know what I mean? But it just happened to be where the fish the where those big carp were at was in that and but that bay was you know 300 yards long at that time and so we gave oh. him like and he was up he was up in the shallows like in the flats where we couldn't even get to so he he's up in like <laughs> you know knee deep of water and we're you know shallower and we're out where you know three four feet so it's not like the fish that we were chasing were the ones that he was after up in up in the weeds up in the up in the shallower <laughs> flats so and like i said there was hundreds thousands you know hundreds of fish in that bay like it's not like we even and we were sitting in one spot and they were just coming by us they were running by in uh you know in schools and like we weren't even close to where he was at so i just don't <laughs> i just don't get it so and yeah, so, so, sometimes you just never know right <laughs> yeah i can't you can't ever be happy but i mean it's just one of those i try to be mindful with everybody i mean i've been you know fishing walleye you know on some of these and you don't get 100 yards 150 yards from another boat they're 20 feet behind 30 feet behind your boat sometimes dragging the same strips you are jigging the same <laughs> yeah. points so i was all like i thought we the courtesy we gave him was a little bit more than i've been given on this rod and reel fishing and stuff i mean heck i've been to alaska where you're fishing two feet from the next person next to you you know oh, yeah. <laughs> so i was like I was like, man, like, it, it sucked. I mean, it sucked. I mean, I like having the spaces to myself, but at the end of the day, sometimes where the fish are at and, you know, two, it's just is what it is. And yeah. you have to deal with, like, you know, so I don't know. I mean, even like, you know, if you're, if you fish the walleye spawn at McConaughey at all with a boat? No, I haven't. Yeah, that one is like, you got to, basically the your lure is under the bow of the boat behind you and you got guys fishing on the beach sit 10 feet from you to your right there's so many boats and people on that dam and it's <laughs> like, you know what i mean it's like it's it's a fun but stressful fishery if you ever get a chance to you'll go you'll catch some big ones but i used to do that i used to do that every year i haven't done it in a couple of years but it was fun but after catching you know eight nine pound wall icons consistently so oh yeah <laughs> that's that those are good size ones yeah and but what else do we have a question for this anybody have questions for what's going on i don't know if anybody live or no i haven't seen any questions come through yet but i mean i get a lot like on my tiktok and stuff the biggest question i get is like what like you asked earlier what we do with the carp when we shoot them and so that's the biggest question asked by most most everybody or it's you like, know. how can you do that to carp? They're such a great fish and they're a game fish. And 
they're naturalized in the United States and you should, you know, <laughs> I've got some guys from Europe. They're like, all right, Bob's all right. Come over there and kick your ass. I'm like, fly over here and do it. then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, no, 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 no. And go ahead and try it. Right. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I, I tell them too, like my thing with carp, I'm like, if you want to go catch them with a rod and reel, go do it. I mean, they're, they are fun to catch. And for most people, for most kids, that's the first fish they catch on a rod and reel. So they're just, no shortage of them so it's one of them you can bow fish them and catch them with a rod and reel and in the end of the day as i asked the i asked these advocates and like the carp association people here in the u.s i'm like if they are such an important species when they are killing off a wetland or poisoning them where are you guys trying to stop it like yeah. you're nowhere to be seen until us bow fishermen come around and then now we're the most evil person around for killing a carp so yeah <laughs> And I, yeah. I asked them that. I'm like, here, I mean, the, and the, you know, states will post areas where they're going to, hey, attention, don't come this area. We're going to, you know, I think they use that retinone is what it's called. We're going to, we're going to give the lake a retinone treatment, they call it. And here they let it set. I think it takes, I think it's two years sometimes before a lake can even bounce back. But the thing is, when they do that, I mean, they risk killing everything. It's not just the, not, not just a fish in the lake. So when it happens it's a pretty severe treatment and i was like you guys don't realize what the extent is and then it gets into where and if the carp get back in there right if they're done with it do you, those lakes get what they call have you heard of new lake syndrome on on a lake they they call it yeah go ahead and explain it for those that you know listening or watching so new lake syndrome say like you know out here in wyoming we deal with where the irrigation and the lakes get dropped down to where you know we have a mass die off where i mean very much the lake dries up and then we have a bad, good year like this and we get water back in there uh the game and the fish will or they stock or fish get in there naturally nature has a way of basically the fish that normally take you know 10 to 15 years to grow to mature size i'll do it in a year or two years so you go from they, it's nature's way of filling that ecosystem and the niche with mature fish and everything. So in three to four years, you have all these massive trophy fish in the lake because it's nature's way of, uh, they have, they basically it's an accelerated growth. And then it starts petering and you get your age difference. They basically come in and they get up to spawning age real quick. And so one of the lakes that I'm, that I shoot are really big fish out of, I think, that's what they've had going in because when you catch like oh, i haven't took a carp out of there that's less than 15 pounds they're all the way up into the 40s uh they're all the rainbows that are in there are 25 you know they're massive fish but you know eight years ago the lake dried up to virtually nothing and so then the water came in there and then bam we got these massive fish everywhere and like sometimes those carp take 25 years to get to you know 30 pounds but they're doing it in less than 10 so in that lake so I mean, it happens with all that with with all the lakes that get that you initially if you build a pond and you don't overly stock it because if you leave you just put enough in there like your bass or your crappie or whatever they'll get to massive size really quick and so you'll have all these big fish and you start stocking and then it'll stunt the growth on all the little ones and so if you overpopulate it it's the same same deal uh, watershed will make its own way so if you start seeing areas that got a lot of little fish a ton of them and no big fish it's because the lake is overpopulated and so some of these areas we see you know three four pound carp that's all you see is because it's overpopulated there's not enough food to sustain a mature fish so and that that's why you have to kind of change size limits and mm -hmm. because you've got too too many little ones you need bigger fish to eat them yeah and you know unfortunately we you know like i said with those carp and the other type of species like that they just out produce and they out compete and pretty soon that's all that's in the lake and when you get that much biomass and population it can destroy the lake because you know lower oxygen levels and then certain lakes like we're on like there's like two parts of the lake one part is super festive with carp and it's just i mean water's murky you you know have poor visibility and you go to the other side where the little channel goes through and there's a few carp in there but it's crystal clear and you see down to 20, 10 15 feet in the daytime and so 
those areas where they get in there, they dig up the bottom so much to their feeding, it just affects the water clarity and the oxygen levels. And <clears throat> that lake in the one side battles blue green, toxic blue green algae like crazy because of the algae blooms and everything that they get from the disturbance of the bottoms and the shallow, and it's a shallow water lake. So they're very destructive when it comes to that type of stuff in natural wetlands and because they just take everything. So, yeah. So, when everybody says that, you know, carp aren't destructive, yes, they are very destructive in, in like wetlands and stuff. You get some like massive reservoirs. I mean, but you go over to the Great Lakes. I just came from the worlds up there, and I've the guys were telling me sometimes the carp spawn is so thick there, like it sounds like the Niagara Falls, they say, from them splashing. Oh, so loud. <laughs> So, I mean, and like I said, they have tournaments where guys come in, there's 250 teams on one small lake and they don't even dent the population of some of those lakes. But sometimes it is like bow fishing is a way to control the numbers of carp and everything. Cause you know, we target one species and if we, there's one lake that I have seen it, that I have made an impact in the past three years. Cause I go in there and take a smaller lake and I've noticed that I'm seeing less and less carp after I've been in there shooting them. So, but I mean, it, it's a, is, it is a good sustainable way to get rid of them. Like we're not going to eradicate them because no, by all means, I don't think we should eradicate a species for something, but if they're in an the area, they don't belong. We need to control them heavily. Right. And that's, you know, my argument, that's a whole nother one I can talk about with wolves is how I, I have some stuff <laughs> and people think I'm crazy, but it's one of those deals where some of the stuff that people say is absolutely wrong so yeah you, you you get that a lot in a lot of places and you know there you can find anything you want on the internet um, yeah you know anywhere from oxygen is bad for you you know <laughs> yeah and i saw people like quit quit reading google <laughs> like when i see some of these you know and a lot of these a lot of people that comment are young kids that like i was like you're talking to a guy that's been you know that does this for a living and just because you find it on google on one you know one page doesn't mean that's what by like when you i talk to biologists and stuff like that and then but the other thing is we get biologists that come in that are animal rights activists and they don't play the middle ground or stuff and they basically cater to their own beliefs and they make it hard for everybody else right because this is what their beliefs are in I like always oh, if I was ever a game and fish, whatever, no matter what, what your belief was of what you believe on something, you need to play the middle ground because there's always two sides of stuff. Like there's a group that wants and a group that doesn't. And the best way is to find that commonality right in the middle. So everybody is happy. Yeah. And, and I've seen that with biologists up in Alaska. Like this one lady was a crab biologist for the, the red King crab. And there's areas you can go and just, you know, fishermen are like, look, look here, this is where you, catch them and she didn't want to believe that they were there and then when they do studies they would do uh they put pots or area that king crab don't live and so like well so your data is skewed because you're putting stuff where they don't live at so right <laughs> and so i think i see we see that all the time in the i think in the outdoor world as you see sometimes data doesn't match what you really see in the wilderness like i've been preaching for a uh, like i said a point system here in parts of wyoming and one of the biologists he told me like well we got other trophy areas it's like now our trophy areas this year like where the big ones are have been hit dramatically so it's like so now i bet you're wishing we put those point systems into effect three years ago five years ago and there's areas where it's they've done uh the deer population have had bad years and they put points restrictions in like three years they bounce back pretty quick because you now you have the age group between like the mature and then the small bucks because like the area where i live i mean the deer population is still here it's got a sustainable amount but i'm also right in the epicenter of the cwd epidemic it's right where it discovered oh. and so we're in a like a 50 percent i think data range of like positive tests during hunting season on on animals and I've seen some guys that are just messaged like, oh, the CWD is, isn't real. You know, it's not, doesn't take effect. I was like, absolutely it does. I've seen deer, I've shot deer that were emaciated where they look like a skeleton and it wasn't EHD. Like EHD, 
you know, kills a deer pretty quickly. You know, CWD is a slow out, you know, slow, horrible death for a deer, I believe. So, yeah, for, but for our people watching, listening, can you explain what the difference is between the, the three letter acronyms you're using? <laughs> yeah, so that, you know, chronic wasting disease is my, what it's equivalent to mad cow disease in, uh, you know, the ungulates, specifically deer. I mean, elk get it, but not as bad. Uh, but it's kind of like it's, I've seen different research. They say it's a prion or it's just a transmitted disease that came from, you know, uh, livestock. So there's two different, and like, it's hard to pick which one they think it is, but it, it's in there and I've seen deer and they, they call them zombie deer because they look just like the walking dead when you do find them. And then you have the EHD, which around here we get, which is weird. Normally it's in like a heavy, you know, uh, moisture area, but we had it come in so hard last year and we were in a drought. So that's kind of where, it, but that's, I think it's caused by a, a gnat or an insect that gets into them and it swells their tongue up and they call it blue tongue. And it basically the, the deer, they uh, die from dehydration pretty much. And so we've had that twice hit here in 10 years it hit our whitetail population pretty heavy there's areas where but in certain parts of wyoming here they're trying to really thin thin out the whitetail to make room for the mule deer because the white tails are actually more aggressive and so they push mule deer out of their out of their areas when they move in and so i don't know if that's been an aspect here where we get in a lot of whitetail populations and it pushes the mule deer out because of their aggressiveness. So, but I, but I mean, last couple of years, I mean, you see one year I saw 200 does in one day and no shootable bucks. And <laughs> you go out in the fall, I, I like going out looking at the herds and looking at big bucks, you know, later on when I have, you know, during pheasant season and you just don't see the age gap between the bigger bucks and the smaller deer. It's, you see a group of a, 50 does with a little two-year-old forked horn in it and there's or you'll come around you'll see that and you see one mature buck within 300 deer and i was talking the game and fit you know that's why i said i'm like you need to implement this but like i said around here everybody road hunts and there's only it's so much private property area and so they're risking taking deer off the roads and stuff and they're all the little deer and the little bucks and i think you know a point management system is very ideal for uh a deer deer herd i mean it works in the whitetail ranches like it doesn't work for the public so that's kind of how i look at it yeah so just you know selective harvest is key with anything you know fishing hunting you know just do what you know do what's right but don't you know try to uh guilt trip people into doing something that's not illegal is how i feel you know, if you want to give your tag, there, there's a program here right now that they're trying to like let a deer walk and there's a bunch of prizes and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, if you want to give your tag up, absolutely. But if you're like me, I supplement my, you know, table for, you know, my, you know, my freezer and stuff with probably 70% wild game, you know, and elk and several deer, you know, upsets the cost, especially you get some guys like, well, no, it costs so much. Like I live in an area, I drive five miles, I can harvest a deer or I can harvest a deer right in my backyard. So for me paying that $30 tag and spending 50 bucks in fuel is cheaper than me going and buying a chuck roast that's $55 at right now for a three pounder at the store. So it's cheaper. Like I like something. So most of my meat, my freezer is wild game compared to beef. Just because of that reason, it's, it's technically cheaper in the long run buying $200 worth of tags in a year. And I get, six months worth of food on the table so well and you don't know what's been put in the meat yeah you know you know there's there's uh hormones and antibiotics that they're feeding you know given to the the cows and whatnot and and you know all these chemicals in there and and um i haven't seen a, a thing i don't know how true it is but uh you know they're trying to figure out how to get some of the our, our dna into the meat so now you're well, eating the stuff with, with the meat and, you know, I don't yeah, know. <laughs> there's some, there's some scary stuff going on, like with the agriculture, like, you know, like I hate to get into like the, 
conspiracy theorist stuff, but you know, we have like, you know, Bill Gates right now is the largest owner of farmland in the country. Did you know that? Yeah. So, and he's big on to like, I mean, he said himself, he's like, you know, no, no modern society should be farming and eating meat. So he's buying up all these ranches and stuff to stop that because his own beliefs, you know, there's that stuff going on. And then we have like, you know, the PETA and everybody and, and the animal activists. I mean, I can go all day long for this stuff, but at the end yeah. of the day, you know, wild game, you know, is the healthiest, you know, organic meat out there. And if it's done right, it's, and always say like all these animal rights, you guys are vegans and stuff. It's like you guys can only be vegan because of modern conveniences at the grocery stores without them. You guys would starve. <laughs> right. <laughs> and well, that's, and then too, you know, that the wild game is better for you. Um, I remember many years ago when I was in an archery club, this guy joined the archery club because he wanted to learn how to bow hunt to get meat. Uh, his kid had been having some problems and they come to find out it's the girth hormones and other antibiotics and, and all the chemicals they stick in the beef. He was not tolerating it. So he was going to get venison for meat for his kid to eat. Yeah. And I mean, it is, it's a very healthy stuff, but there's also a, a tick borne disease that's out now that is, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's my sister told me about this when she was in the ER, when she worked in, you know, the ER down there in Arkansas, because guys were coming in like deathly sick to like iron and stuff from like eating red meat. Have you heard of this? That comes from the Lone Star takes called Alpha Gal that basically huh. bites you. You become allergic to like red meat and iron and everything. And it's death. You get deathly allergic to it. <laughs> yeah. That, that's, so, that's strange. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we all see Lyme disease and, it just showed up like a few years ago and makes me wonder if, and I found some stuff to where you get into this stuff, like the conspiracy theorists again, that, you know, these labs and people are coming up with ways to get people, you know, through insects and they bite you that they're make, they're creating these things. Cause it just randomly showed up about four, about four years ago. Cause my sister was like, are you going to be careful with the ticks out hunting and stuff? Cause the people that were sick were hunters and getting it from like Turkey hunting out there getting bit by this tick. So, huh. and it's kind of, it's kind of a scary thing to think about, but it's more in like that Southwestern, you know, te Texas range. And that's like, wow, I never even thought about that would be a thing to worry about when I go hunting in Texas and that <laughs> stuff now, like makes me yeah. not want to go down there. Cause I like, I like eating my wild game and that stuff. I mean, I, I don't think I could eat chicken for the rest of my life, you know? Right. But yeah, it's kind of one of those funny things that make people think about for just conspiracy theorist stuff. And it's, you know, I start, I get bored. I'll start reading on that, but that alpha gal thing is a pretty big thing. And I just don't know if, but to, <laughs> had to believe where it came from. <laughs> yeah. Cause <laughs> But I mean, it could it could have been around a long time, and that's why people have food allergies. It's just from that nat nature selection of stuff. So, I, you don't know. It, it's hard to yeah. tell. You don't know who to but, believe and who not. But you know what? Yeah, eating wild game is is generally the best thing to do anyway. Yeah, and you know, like I said, when I grew up in Alaska, you know, food was so expensive. We ate so much fish, and you know, you know, you get a moose. I mean, that stuff was like shooting a beef. So that's kind of why I still do it down here is i'd rather eat the wild game and all that stuff even though i have two freezers full of it kind of like an emergency stash right now because i don't yeah. know if stuff's gonna when the grocery stores get so expensive i don't want to and i like I said last year i didn't really draw anything i think i shot one deer and this year i'm hoping to fill refill the freezer so i get back where i can start doing that stuff again and but i try to butcher like you know my own my own animals and everything and it's more as like i just tell like friends that like play like wild game or eating meat i'm like you need to go out and you know either but you know harvest a farm animal like a cow or something and do it all yourself once because it makes you respect where your where your food comes from in my opinion you respect yeah, yeah it does from the whole aspect because Everybody's like, oh, you just do it because, you know, I call us hunters and stuff. We're just bloodthirsty. I was like, no, it's, you know, taking a life and doing all that stuff. I mean, it's not just an easy aspect. I mean, sure, I go out and I, I shoot some prairie dogs and stuff like that. But for the most part, it's, I don't, it, 
when you take a big animal's life, like it's kind of one of them deals where it's surreal sometimes, I guess, for some things. Like I, I worked with a guy up in Alaska and he told me the worst, worst and best thing he's ever done in his life was take his elephant. But he's like, you can never pay me enough money to do it again, is what he told me. <laughs> and he's like, that was the only animal that I've ever taken that I sat down and cried for, is what he, what he told me. Like he said, it was super emotional and everything. He's like, you know, I did it when I was like 33. And this is an, an old, it's an older gentleman that went all around the world. And you had a, like this massive trophy room and was big with Safari Club International and stuff. And that's, he's like, just the, he's like, it was, it's a experience that was, he's like, it wasn't something I, you know, as a hunter, I've, he's like, as you can see, but I, I can never do that again, you know? so like you know we, we, you know i say that we're all bloodthirsty and compassionate but he's like but the thing about he's like taking it like the amount of people that animal fed and how like you said it was like you're out in the middle of nowhere all of a sudden there's a hundred people coming out of nowhere to butcher this animal and he's like that elephant was taken every part of it was taken and he's like you know i like, think that's everybody just thinks that we go out and these big game trophy hunting stuff is all about just taking the trophy but in reality it actually does a lot more good than people think it does for for certain right. people there a lot of people get to eat off of off of it yeah. and you know we're oh i think his internet went out on him <laughs> we'll see if it comes back here yeah i know when you when you when you shoot an animal you know that the meat can feed you know either you and your family for a long period of time or multiple families like in case he's talking about with the elephant um it, it just takes you know you can feed so many people from it a whole village you know can possibly eat off of that one animal and multiple meals and it's just really um really good when you go out in and, and like i was talking about earlier it's it's really good meat and um, yeah i think it lost lost his internet connection but yeah, it's it's been uh, um, really good talking with Tom, and got a lot of good stories. It look, this this podcast took a little bit different turn, uh, you know, a little bit more more in fishing. Yeah, you know, bow fishing is a really a really fun thing to do. I, you know, did it as a kid, and you know, I've got my bow fishing setup is my recurve, just because you know I don't have time to draw a compound and you know find the the side and everything else. No. You got to look at the, where the fish is, where you want to shoot and, and just go. And it, it, it's a lot of fun to do, you know, whether you're fishing or hunting, shooting your bow, shooting your guns, shooting anything. Um, it, it's just a lot of fun. We'll sport the vulture skills. And, and nice about learning how to bow fish and hunt with archery is we can always go out and get food. You know, we don't have to worry about, uh, you know, where our projectiles are going because we're not going long range, uh, you know, like with a firearm, you know, firearms are good. I, I have several of my own, but hey, it's it's just a lot of fun, fun doing it. So we've been been on the, the line here for, for quite a while. So uh, it's been really great talking with Tom, learning about it, the bow fishing and uh, up there. And as well as I learned stuff here about uh, Nebraska, I don't get out a lot of bow fishing, uh, but it's it's a lot of fun. So I think we'll go ahead and uh, end this one. Make sure you uh, uh, follow, follow the channel. Go out to the Archer Talk 101 Facebook group. There you can get all of the videos uh, that we record for the podcast. You get them live uh, when we record them. Uh, if you go out to the podcast, they come out on Mondays and Friday mornings. Then I also post the video of this on my YouTube channel on Tuesdays and Thursday nights at 6. So you can always get them there. Um, not sure if you're trying to come back here or not, but uh, yeah, it's it it's a lot of, a lot of fun. And if you have any questions, just get get a hold of us. I see you. Welcome back, Tom. <laughs> yeah, my phone overheated for some reason. Oh yeah. <laughs> so I'm sitting there and I'm like, what the hell? So I had to yeah. turn the. I'm sitting in my pickup. I had to turn the AC on. Hopefully it'll keep that going. So. <laughs> sorry about yeah. that no i I've, I've had that too when uh, uh out recording 
you know, video for what, my YouTube channel and I got my phone all it's hot and all of a sudden, okay, I can't video. I got to let it cool off. So it's like, okay, I'm not stopping. So I just, okay, I, I, if I ever got hot, I missed a piece of it, but I'm going to go on. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> sorry about that. I was like, oh, damn it. That's the first time ever happened to me. So. Yeah, I say all of a sudden you're frozen. It's like, okay, I think your internet's out. And then, then you disconnected. And yeah, so I kind of went on. I, I talked a little bit about it. So, uh, but yeah, we've been okay. on for um, two hours uh, almost. Yeah, seems. two hours almost. But sometimes they go long. And I planned for an hour, but yeah, very seldom I ever hold to an hour because, you know, unless yeah. we have something going on, it, it's, it's so much fun talking about all this stuff. And time seems to just get away from us. And yeah, I just, just tell them, you know, hey, you know, shooting sports is fun. <laughs> yeah, know? whether it's archery or yeah, anything, like it's a good addiction for people. I mean, I'd rather see people in the outdoors and doing this stuff and, you know, especially trying to get kids involved. That's the big thing right now is getting kids back involved into this, into this stuff. Um, we're trying to, with our association here, like, talk about like the, you know, the Wyoming Boat Fishing Association kind of we're kind of I'm trying to like I said I got just voted president I want to remake it to where it's more bigger than what it is right now to do more stuff uh one of the things by the big passion I do I love taking kids out and like getting into the sport and stuff like some days I'll get bored and I'm going to scouting I'll go grab you know some of the local kids here in town and we go out and shoot fish on the local lake but our I've been talking with some people as the hard part is, is getting the sponsorships and the stuff right. to make the stuff happen. But I want to make uh, a trailer because Eastern Nebraska, you, you know, Rich Porter kind of does this. I think, I think you know him. Yeah, I know Rich. Yeah. So, you know, they have that, why they have that youth bow fishing stuff, you know, mentorship program over in Eastern Nebraska. This is where I kind of got, they did that here in Wyoming. They have a trailer with bows and everything. They go teach archery safety and all this stuff. And, doing all that stuff. I'd like to get that happening out here in Wyoming to encompass northern Colorado, you know, western Nebraska, because all that stuff's easternly in like all of Wyoming and just right. try to get kids right. involved. And we did our first youth shoot a couple like last you know, last year I want to say. You know, we had eight kids show up. We were able to get them all prized and everything, but I'd like to make it bigger than what it is and do stuff to where they show up to like a mini camp and we teach them archery safety, boating safety, that type of thing. And then get get them out on the boat and go have fun and just enjoy the outdoors or do specialty events with like you know at-risk kids that don't have that availability to do that so hey come on out we can do all this stuff for you and that trailer is mobile so we don't got to do it here in wyoming we can like hey we'll go over to nebraska and you have western nebraska on a lake and do it there go down to colorado and just to get kids and you know away from all these video games and these minor society that, that they're all addicted to and their phone screen give them something more fun to look into like when we were kids so yeah we we spent you know when i was a kid we spent well there was no cell phones when i was a kid yeah there's no cell phones when i was a kid either i remember when nintendo was like the big year you had one you were like the king of the block but yeah we still i remember riding my bike you know up in alaska for miles just to go catch a fish or you know stuff like that and you know kids these days are like what do you mean we're going to go out and do this? You see a lot less kids involved in outdoor activities than it used to be. So if we can get, you know, more kids involved. And once you do get one hooked, that's like an addiction for them. And they're, oh, it's the coolest thing I've ever done. Yeah. And that's the nice thing about, you know, bow fishing is the action is there and they just have a blast. And they're like, oh, like I, one day I had six of them and there were like kids. I mean, it was, it was, it was a hectic, chaotic mess, but it was, it was still fun. So. Yeah, I was like, when, but when I had my story, you know, get somebody that, you know, interested in archery, but never shot and almost kind of afraid of it and, yeah. and get them all set up. And that first shot goes off and, and they just it's like, whoa, can I do it again? Yeah, yeah I was like, oh, let's just try one. You know, I try one. It's like, can I do it again? Can I do it again? Yeah, you yeah. can do it again. You can do it again. You can do it again. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, that's. Like archery is a fun to get everybody involved in the family, you know, even with the family. And like I said, I've been kind of slacking on it the last few years, and just because I've had difficulties with my, you know, my vision has made it hard with trying to do the compound stuff. 
and finding those the right way to shoot like i know like you know brought you know Pigman does a way with he shoots with his left eye but he shoots right handed and he's got a specialty way using iq sights that make it happen is pretty like i've watched him he's still one of the best archery shots i've ever seen and he's shoots with a you know a different eye and i so don't recommend it it's it's very difficult to do yeah but... and and he and that's what he said it took him a long time to a lot of dedication to find that sweet spot and he said the only site that he's able to make that work is with the IQ. Because that retina lock technician, you know, that lights and everything, but, you know, he shoots. I mean, it's remarkable. And I, and I was trying to do it myself, and I just haven't been able to do it. So I'm just going to, yeah. I think, uh, go with I, what I'm used to is going back to the traditional things. Since I do it so much with bow fishing, it's more of a natural instinct now for me to do that. I mean, I can smack the fish, you know, at 30 yards on the surface. So, I mean, when I'm on, so. So I think I'm going to, that's my decision. I'm going to go with the lever bow and go back to the traditional hunting, which that's what I started out doing, which I really enjoyed. So it's a lot more, I mean, I've had those shots at big bull elk, you know, 10, 12 yards, which is a lot more fun than sometimes than oh, even hitting one, just getting him to come in and being stuck in that situation where you're behind a tree and the elk is right there. You can pretty much smell him as he can smell you and you're in those close in quarters. And sometimes that's just the fun of it than even getting one, you know, getting that big animal to come in. And that's what I enjoyed about, it, I think more is doing the, doing the chase sometimes than, uh, than, than shooting them. So. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the hunt. Yeah. You know, it's more the hunt than the kill. The kill is yeah, just I mean, a reward for the hunt. <laughs> Yeah, like when you know when I, when I get my my doe tags, I call it shopping because I go out to I have friends that have you know farms and stuff, and it's an easy opportunity. And they say, "Hey, go out! I need some deer thinned out." Or my or my brother calls it when they're still corn up peak last because he he calls it what I do is peekaboo deer hunting because I walk the corn rows and just look down and the deer are trying to not see you uh, know behind the corn rows, and so <laughs> I just shoot them down the corn rows and drag one out. But yeah, they're down there trying to hide their heads from you. <laughs> so he, he named it peekaboo deer hunting because i'm just peeking down the rows really really quietly and <laughs> you know then you know don't you know like i said if i don't if i have to drive if i have to drag a deer like no more than 50 yards i i, I don't take them so it's kind of funny keep, keep them close yeah, yeah and it, it, that's what i mean about nice. you know about the selective harvest too is like i go out there and i'll watch the herd of deer in the evening and I can see which one is the mature deer and don't have the fawns. And like, it's more of a, like I said, a shopping thing, but it's, I'm taking the ones that need to be taken and not the, right. you know, ones that, you know, like when you go elk hunting, you look for that dry cow that doesn't have a calf with her. So, but yeah, that's, so that's, I'm a firm believer and you shoot, you, you, you take the right animals when they need to. And there's areas where, you know, you just need to thin them out. Like when I go hunt in Missouri, one of the ranches I go hunt to, I have to shoot two two does before I can even take a buck. And oh so, yeah, yeah. You know, so it's one of them deals. that's they you get so overrun, and they want and they give you extra tags for that purpose, but it's because there's too many deer for the area to sustain. So it just it's like a cyclical thing, and same with everybody else. Like we had a bad winter kill be a few years, so the population bounces back. The elk population here is skyrocketing so i mean there's no shortage of elk this year but the western side of the state you know has absolutely been hit hard and like i said when i um put in for my areas for hunting i take that into consideration which areas are going to be the viable one to hunt to so and and i'm gonna hey, you want to go to the ones that have you know the the bigger population of what you're looking for yeah and so that's you know, like I said, I got this is the first year I've drawn a mule deer doe tag in three years. So I, I took, <laughs> I took, so I, I drew two mule deer doe tags. I drew one. I normally I draw, two, I try to do two or three antelope, but I went to one antelope this year. So, and I have a friend that's got some property that he didn't have as much winter kill on there. And that's where I'm going to go take mine at because there he's got a population that you can harvest and he doesn't let really anybody out there so that's the other thing is the pressure oh, out there yeah. so that's what i mean it's like you know being a responsible hunter like it's what we all should be 
taking a practice and not just taking uh, the, I guess the, the easiest opportunity because, oh, I can type deal, like especially years where it is a rough year on stuff, you need to be a responsible hunter and not. But we get those other, you know, like I said, we have those right now, everybody's pressuring people, telling don't come to the state this year, you know, don't hunt, you know, it's not ethical of you. And I, and I was like, you know, it's their right to hunt. We can't tell people what to do. That's their money, their tag. The season's not closed. I mean, just, it's going to be harder for people to hunt this year. I mean, I don't think the numbers of, you know, hunting success rates going to be high this year, but I mean, if it, if it gets any worse, it's going to be, uh, you know, I think hopefully the game of fish do emergency closures and they've already dropped season and tag numbers. Like some areas that have 14 days that down to less than a week now, where that's three days hunting. So it's, I think there's where the pressure and stuff's coming away. Not everybody's going to shoot their deer. And, but with that being said though, too, the pressure is on for some people too, you know, so you're going right. to, that's the other aspect of having a super short season versus closing it is you're going to put the pressure on these guys like, Oh, I got to get my deer. Because so there's gonna be a harder pressure too on the smaller deer that that rate too in my in my opinion. So yeah, because you, you've got three days, I'm not gonna pass pass one up because then I don't. Yeah, I and I come all the way and... from you know Missouri or Texas, or it took me five years to draw this tag, and so the pressure is gonna be on for them to just feel their tag that they shot. So I hope right. If anybody listening that has that, take that into consideration. Like I will, I'm not going to say don't hunt, but you know, don't just try to pressure yourself to fill that tag because you drew it, you know, you know, be responsible and do the right thing. I mean, like I always been told if don't, if you're going to shoot the same deer on the first day than the last day, you know, maybe, but don't shoot the small ones. You know, look for those bigger mature deer that are, that you know, made it through that are stronger, leave those younger ones to, come up the next couple of years so well and you get more meat too <laughs> yeah and then that's what i get too i've i've talked you know, get to the these guys and say oh you trophy hunters and all you do is horn hunt and i do it for the food and you know i don't shoot big deer i'm like absolutely you would if a big four by 200 inch muley came out in front of you you guys wouldn't hesitate like I always call them call them out on that like you're not gonna be like oh there's a 200 inch buck and there's a doe or a spike next to them and take it no you're gonna take that big buck everybody would like i don't i don't oh, care oh who yeah you, are. you know i you know, i don't specifically hunt for for bucks you know i hunt for the does because yeah. you know more than me but you know what if a nice buck comes by i'm not passing it up <laughs> yeah and and that and that's why i you know i used to get doe tags so i, f I fill my freezer and then i go out and have fun and look for that deer kind of deal like you know, like I said, sometimes for me, it's going and seeing other parts of the country, going in there hiking, going seeing. To me, it's that challenge going into places, and I'm getting kind of old and overweight now that I, my body can't do as much anymore. <laughs> I still push it. I still push it to where I can, but I, that's you know that to me, that's what I enjoy going out there. And if I don't see the buck I want to shoot, I'm not. I'm not going to take it. Right. So, and right now, I mean, I've shot a lot of a lot of decent deer. I'm on that. 200 inch like hunt right now I'm, I'm looking for that for that big one that i've never got in my life that's been my unicorn like a big white tail bucks my unicorn like i've shot i've seen them i haven't been able to get them i've or they get away from me you know and so i, I you know I, I have personal preferences of the one i want to take i mean i like you know if i want to go shoot small deer there's areas where you go do that where they are overpopulated but like i said like i have a couple deer in my head that i want to get and they're just they're my, they're my unicorns and i'm not gonna like i said it's been three years since i've taken the mule deer mule deer buck for that reason so so deer have been safe for me for two years for three years <laughs> <for the> podcast. <laughs> and then last year you know i have a little chunk of property out here and i get here in about a month i'll start seeing them i get these big bucks that come in they hang out tell about like, ooh, I've been watching them in the evenings. I'm going to get the bow out and go do some stocks on them. And so it'd be nice to get a pretty cool velvet buck, too. And then a week and a half before archery season, they just disappear. <laughs> it's like they know archery season is coming up. Yeah. And then, then then during rifle season, you know, I got a, I got a few does and little bucks hanging out, you know, and I, I, I let them go then that like the two days after the area where I live closed, I'm coming in from work and it was right in the evening. And I'm like, what is that? Like, when did a tree grow next to my driveway? 
and this big old massive 160 some inch buck stands up with like 10 does i'm like where were you three days ago you know, yeah. <laughs> you know and it's, it's, it's always my luck. I always see these big ones. Like a couple of years ago, I had, like, cause I drew my late season whitetail buck tag because work this year, everybody wants to go off in October to hunt. So I, I chose to draw right. a late season whitetail tag. I do have a mule deer general tag I can get, but yeah, there's a couple, there's one year it turned into a, it turns into a doe tag in mid December. And the day after it turned into a doe tag, I ran into a 160 inch whitetail out of the flats when I was out pheasant hunting. And I sat there and watched him and I had permission to hunt where he was at. Like I said, the ethical thing, like told me, it's like, you know, I could take him probably and get away with it. But, you know, I, that's, that's where it gets into where people get in trouble because they do, they do stuff like that. But I mean, that, that yeah. here was massive. It's one of the biggest white tails I've ever seen in person, especially when you're out and it's hunting them out in the grass flats here in Wyoming, Eastern Wyoming. It's, they're in pockets so when you do see a massive buck because they get in that grass they sleep all day and when you do see one out not in the day it was pretty impressive so yeah he, he, he was massive he was that one that you want that main beam five with eye guards i mean the perfect it was the perfect white tail in my opinion and big big massive typical and i was like yeah gotta sat there and watched him but i drove down to my buddy where he was looking for a white tail doe, my like, hey, come look at this deer. And he drove down and saw and sat there and watched him. And he's like, damn, that's a big one. I was like, yeah. <laughs> Too bad we couldn't have seen him yesterday because we have permission to hunt that spot. <laughs> so yesterday, but not today. <laughs> yeah. And then yeah, it's it, it's it's been fun. Like that's the part I enjoy about hunting too. Like when I lived in Alaska, I wasn't as much of a hunter as it was when I came down to back to Wyoming. I, I was like a diehard fisherman. Like I love steelhead fishing, king salmon fishing. Like I was a, you know, I said I, I worked on commercial fishing boats, and then I come down here, and it's more of a hunting community. Like I taught myself how to call geese and all that stuff, and a lot, a lot of the stuff is I will say YouTube. <laughs> like I actually got I got hurt I you know, I got hurt when I was fishing, and I guess hunting and doing the calling thing and everything was kind of my way. And like I said, boat fishing was my way of kind of rehabilitating myself so yeah and yeah like i said bow fishing went from me just taking my dogs down for a walk and seeing carp and buying a cheap hundred dollar bow off of a website to now i own a i started a, a bow fishing guide business you know <laughs> like the the, the but, full range and i hear a lot of those yeah. same stories you just you start off you you want it you get one and next thing you know you're you're going in and doing all kinds of things and yeah you know hear those stories a lot and I mean, I will say my my rod and reel fishing time has significantly signif I can't say that word right now, like tongue twister, <laughs> uh, decreased since I bought the bow fishing boat because I spend so much time shooting all these carp and like it's it's pretty funny. I mean, because I, yeah. I do I, I I love to eat fish. I love to eat fresh walleye and crappie and all that stuff. It's one of my <laughs> I don't do it as much anymore. Normally I go on like a walleye trip, like I said to McConaughey, and I'd go bring back 20 pounds of fillets, you know, in a week. And having a, now I, I post, now it's how many, like, how many carp can I shoot in a night now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Still out there having fun. Yeah. And well, um, so, yeah, yeah like I said, we've I, been I, on here for a while. So, um, yeah, it's been we'll really to, great talking with you. Uh, we'll I think we can talk again. for a couple more hours. Yeah, let's do this again. Yeah. And... I, maybe I'll drag the boat out. And we can do a live one on the <laughs> on the water for something fun, yeah. something different. So. Yeah, yeah, we we could do that, and uh, also tell you we we could do one a review of the bows when you get ready to them. You know, we yeah, can like, do a review on them, and yeah, I'll, like, I'll, 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 I'll get on there because I, I do some reviews on like reels and type of like I always talk to. You know, I see that you guys, hey, I'm interested in bow, in bow fishing. What do I do? And I, I actually will tell them this, it's going to be addicting to spend the money and bite the bullet earlier, but this is what you really <laughs> want to get into with, for, like I said, sa like safety purposes. I don't want anybody to go out and get wrong information from somebody and that are just, you know, because like I, I spend, you know, my life is pretty much now in, in, with bow fishing. You know, like I said, the president of our association now, 
dealing with, you know, the Bofish Association of America, the state representative and stuff. So, I mean, I'm pretty uh, committed my life in, into this. And I met some cool people and I, without it, I probably would have met some of the people I've done. And so I'm pretty, I'm pretty passionate about it and getting people out there and just having fun. That's another way for enjoying the outdoors. So, and getting yeah. to something that's keeps your pastime. We you can shoot your bow more than just a few times a year, I guess, like some, some people do. <laughs> And I, I, yeah. I will say everybody that comes out with these crossbow bow fishing stuff is like, you're insane. I will say that. <laughs> <laughs> That's but, a I lot mean, of work to cock one of those as much times as you yeah, shoot them. And then they make these ones and I just like, I. everybody tries and I've never seen one succeed yet. So that's all I'm saying. Just stop wasting money, you know? Yeah. <laughs> And the biggest thing is guys like, well, I need to shoot a crossbow because of my shoulder injury. I have a full shoulder reconstruction injury. If a 10 year old kid can bow a bow back and go bow fishing. So, so can an adult man. That's how I look at it. So it's just, it's, you <laughs> yeah. Know. yeah. Might, that, might yeah, change okay. a few things, but you can make it work. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's some things out there where, you know, there is people that do need a crossbow, but I was like, I look at it when you see uh, that dude and, I know a friend that has one arm and a guy that shoots a bow with his legs and he's a way better shot than I've ever been in my life. You know, those wounded veterans guys that do that stuff. I mean, any, any like if anything is possible. So if you want to do it, you can do it. So yeah, it's just don't make excuses. So. Yeah. You, you don't need our arms to be an archer or Matt Stutzman to uh, prove that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Like my, yeah, like my friend Lance, uh, What's his last name? But he's shooting from PSC. Uh, yeah, he's a great dude. Has one arm designed a prosthetic uh, piece. So he, you know, hits the stuff, and that dude's an amazing archer. Archer, so great, great dude. So I mean, I you see these guys that shoot with their legs, and I wish I could be that good of a shot with my with my arms. You know. <laughs> yeah. <So>. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean it's. Like I said, I'm gonna start going back into the hunt with the uh, traditional stuff and might have a deal on this brand new PSC Expedite NXT for some if they want to trade. <laughs> 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 so, never been fired, you know, custom built, sitting hanging on a I got two bows hanging on a on a hook in my basement that I haven't used in <laughs> just, just <laughs> because it's been difficult, but yeah. And, or I'll just save them for a friend, or if I have a kid, they can have them. So, yeah. But yeah, like I said, I'm going to go back, I think, to what I've been doing most. And it's the traditional part of stuff, I think, is a lot more fun. Like I said, I enjoy seeing how close I can get to animals. I even do that when I'm rifle hunting. Like the closer I can get, the better. Just because, you know, I don't, it's, I don't like be tempted to shoot something in the canyon behind me and I can't even get to it because, like, oh, I made that. Oh, boat. yeah. Now, you know what I mean? I'd rather know that I can drop the animal ethically and do that stuff. So that's kind of why I enjoy the archery part when actually I do it. So it's the chase yeah. for the most part. Yeah. The frustration yeah. for missing makes you want to go back and do it again and be like, what I do wrong? Let me do it again. Because I don't, I don't hunt from blind. It's all, you know, spot and stock. So you find that and you go in there and you play the animal on its own, on their own, uh, on their own ground. Like I almost got a Send a nice white tail buck at 30 yards, spot stalking in the grass one day. So, I mean, yeah, <laughs> I shot, barely shot under his belly, you know, and yeah, I mean, that was pretty impressive. I had to take my shoes off and my socks and got on him. I just didn't make the shot, but just at the getting that close to a white tail buck like that, you know, on, on his own, on its own turf is pretty impressive. So, yeah, it's kind of interesting when you do that. I did that one time. I took my boots off and and there was just grass, you know, maybe just a couple, you know, a foot or so tall along the edge. And, and I got clear up to it, you know, about, oh, five, six feet away. But I couldn't do anything with it because I can't draw my bow from basically laying on my belly. Yeah. <laughs> if I had a crossbow, I, I could have, but not, not with the compound. It's like, so I just yeah, kind of back, a, wait for leaving and backed out. <laughs> I, had, I had an antelope do that to me. I was chased. I ended up taking him with a rifle, but I, I spent two weeks chasing him with the bow and then he was always one step ahead of me like always like I finally I got on him one day I was like oh I where I took my socks my boots off put like two pairs of big wool socks on my belly crawled got to where he was at and I looked up there he was I was getting my arrow knocked on a little knoll and I was kind of turned and I heard a snort 
and I took over my shoulder and he's 25 yards behind me and I couldn't make that turn to get him. <laughs> like he <laughs> saw me poke up and see him and he'd come around because they're so curious and had, had right where I couldn't turn and he's like, I got you. <laughs> you know. <laughs> He's like, he's like you again, huh? So, <laughs> and I ended up, you know, taking him. But I, I, I mean, I spent, you know, two weeks during archery season and took him like the third day of rifle season. But it was one that I played with him. He's like, oh, it's you again. Like, <laughs> and, he, and he'd go and he'd hang out like 80, 90 yards, 100 yards from me and just snort at me. Like, oh, you can't get me. You know, it's like, it's like he knew. <laughs> Yeah, so, until and, come uh, rifle season, we had the long range weapon. <laughs> yeah, and well, the first day I sh- the first time I shot at him, I missed, oh. and I was like, "What the what the hell?" And I, because I do a lot of antelope hunting and stuff with with, with the two two three. Everybody's like, "Oh, I should like I drop a lot of my antelope and deer with it." And it's the first time I ever had a, a scope with the side parallax on it. And I didn't like I found it. You had to have that specifically set on the ranger shooting because i was like what the hell i thought my i dropped my gun and everything and i went out i was shooting uh nickels at 200 yards i just but i had, had that parallax thing set i then i went out and grabbed my other rifle came back that evening and popped him at the first shot but it was like <laughs> I'm, out there, I'm like three I'm like what the hell like this thing is dialed in and i found out they had that parallax you have to set it directly with the yardage on that scope so i learned the hard <laughs> way you know it was 100 yeah. 150 He's 125 yards, and I couldn't hit it. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got to know your equipment. Yeah, and it was like it was a brand new, you know, scope I got playing with it. It was had the turrets and stuff, and it was just one of them. I was like, I put it on the infinity setting, and I learned you got to have it exactly at the yardage you're shooting at with the stuff. So it was a a learning experience. So yeah. Uh, well, hey, uh, we've been we've been on here for quite a while. It's been great talking to you. Yeah, I gotta I'm go. I'm sure you got, got things about to do. And... <laughs> 50 million flies on my pickup. I got all this carp in my truck. I gotta go get rid of. They're steaming in this hot sun. Oh. So I better go. I better go <laughs> yeah, dump you're... those things before I start getting like <laughs> I'm gonna have any neighbors. But I need to go do this and wash my truck. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you go take care of the carp, and uh, I'm sure we'll be talking later. Uh, uh, we'll be on do this again. Yeah, and uh, is Archery Talk 101's your group on Facebook? Yes. Okay, I'll get on there and add it and all that other fun stuff. And like I said, if they're interested, just look me up on Cowboy Bow Fishing. You know, whether they're interested in art, you know, get into bow fishing and stuff, I'm more than happy to answer questions. So whether it's coming on a trip or just learning and getting into gear and everything, I'm more than happy to help with that type of stuff. So that's what that's what I found that works my experience. Yeah, yeah like I said, if they have any questions, just reach out. I'll be more than happy to talk with them or, you know, how to get into areas and what to do. Uh, so it's something I, like I said, I can talk for hours about stuff like I'm pretty passionate about it, as you can see. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I'll, I'll have to merge the, the two together. I, uh, for those listening, I, I, I hit wrong key and it stopped recording. So I started back up again. But uh, yeah, um, it, it's been really great talking with you, Tom. Um, I know we've, we've talked for quite a while and uh, we could probably talk a lot longer, but you have things to do and I got things to go do. And, yeah, it's been, it's been a lot of fun. So yeah, sure it's tough for people to do so. Y- yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, it's, right. it's nice talking. We'll definitely have to do it again, Roy. And fun time. Like I didn't even think it was two hours until I looked at the clock. So oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, it goes by quick. You know, we try for yeah. an hour, but you know, we never hit an hour. Roy's over. Uh, yeah, like I said, you're you're the second podcast I've done, so it's been pretty fun doing these things. I enjoy doing. I enjoy doing them. So. Yeah. Uh, my name is Roy Canterbury. I've been your host today on Arch Talk 101. And uh, w- with Tom as our, our special guest talking about bow fishing and well as everything else. And, and I dig it. Everything else. Uh, stay tuned for the next one. Uh, we'll be coming up. Um, I do these twice a week and it's it's so much fun. So we'll right. see everybody next time. Yes, y'all. Thank you for having me, Roy. I appreciate it. And we'll have to do another one for sure. So yeah, we will. All right. right. Thanks, Roy. Have a good day, man.